And we are back in the back story and blasting out on the radio in the Empire of Lies on 105.5 FM and AM 1390 in Washington, D.C. Joined now by the great Joe Loria. Joe, how you doing? I'm fine, Lee. How you doing? Doing great. And really pleased to have you with us. We were just talking with Al Keller, one of our callers, about the rumors about Xi Jinping. They're saying that there's been a military coup. Now, as uh, one of the great <laughs> indie news publishers, when you hear stuff like this, how do you approach? Because obviously, if there's Sorry. a military coup, it's a big story. But when you hear about a story like this, how do you approach it, Joe? It, it, first of all, where, where is this coming from? From social media? I mean, I've seen these tweets. I saw someone at Newsweek, uh, a reporter who apparently won a Pulitzer Prize and some other big awards from mainstream media, was tweeting it out, but then had to, uh, and said it was a rumor, and then had to pull it back later. So, I mean, I would ignore this story completely. Uh, I don't know where the origin of it is. But I think if this, uh, we just have to wait to see if something like this is true. And we will uh, see pictures from Beijing. We will hear people from there. I mean, it is not a completely closed society. We're not talking exactly about North Korea here. So uh, if something like that right. happened, we would know it. And it's it's yeah. rubbish. It's rubbish. I wouldn't, I'd spend five seconds talking about it, frankly, Lee. No, no, that sums up what, what I think. But I, I, you know, I almost think people learning what your approach to something like this is, you come into it skeptically, right? Yes, I would You're... call, you know, I mean, normally I would call someone at the Chinese government in the embassy here in Washington or at the UN, but not in this case, because they, they would laugh at us and they would never say whether it was true or not anyway. So yes, absolutely skeptical on every story you approach. You must. That's a bedrock of journalism. That's we don't see a lot of it anymore, especially when it comes to U.S. officials unnamed pushing some classified information, leaking it to push American agenda, which is what the mainstream media does, unfortunately. No, and that's and it's gone into, I would say, overdrive in the past six, eight months since Russia began the special military operation. I've really never seen it this bad of blatant lies. Over and over and over again. That well, they it's never. War. It's wartime, Lee, and both every side lies and puts out nonsense. And uh, so we we seem in the United States to think that we've got this free, objective and serious professional press. So that it's shocking when you know that they're just regurgitating things that are coming from Ukrainian officials or U.S. officials, unnamed. Just go back to any war, First World War. The the Germans were eating babies <clears throat> in Belgium. I mean, we've got a long history what? of this. Yeah. So that's what they were reporting no. then. So now we're hearing stuff that you cannot verify, uh, especially what's going on on the ground. This is uh, whatever either side says. I definitely do not accept at first glance. If both sides are saying the same thing happened, then that's when you can pretty much assume that it's true. But if they don't, we, you just can't decide necessarily. Unless you're there on the ground yourself observing it. And there are very few war correspondents on the ground there, especially from the West. And I'm certainly not there. <laughs> now, Joe Loria, I point out that you're one of the premier publishers in independent, actual independent media at Consortium News and founder of Robert Perry. Is it a mistake, you think, for people to assume that news coverage used to be better? I think in some ways it used to be better, but I think in a lot of ways this news coverage for decades has been a pile of lies. Do you agree? Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of deception going on. Yes, uh, I don't think the press has ever been what uh, some people may have thought it was. It was never yes close to perfect. However, there have been some fundamental changes. Uh, let's look at television news for a moment. Go to YouTube and look up uh, the first ever broadcast of CNN. You could see it. It's there. The whole couple of hours of it. It's extraordinary. 
interviews with the president, uh, investigative reports 10 minutes long on a faulty fuel gauge on, a, on airlines. They gave news. They did investigations. They showed that you could do journalism on TV. What happened? Fox News really changed the game because they made an openly, openly partial uh, partisan broadcast for the Republicans. And they killed CNN and MSNBC, which just had started some time after that. They killed them in the ratings, and that's the name of the game, obviously. So what did you see? Gradually, CNN and MSNBC have turned into just a mouthpiece for the Democratic Party. So you've lost any kind of television news, and what you've got are talk show hosts, not news anchors, not news presenters, as you once did. People who, like Walter Cronkite, for example, had a background in print journalism, newspapers or wire services. That's where those guys came from. Now they're 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 movie stars. They are it's all about the personality of the presenter in each show. And they're saying the same garbage and it's a talk show. So there's no more T V news. In terms of newspaper journalism, there were some in New York City there were twelve newspapers at one time. Eight dailies when I grew, when I was born. So they're down to uh three essentially now. Two tabloids in the New York Times. There's been a consolidation of ownership. Um, and we've also seen, of course, from the 50s, the CIA without question infiltrating newsrooms to control what's going on. And now it seems like they don't even need to do that because CIA officials are actually former and national security officials are on TV right now. So they are directly involved in promulgating what used to be just whispered in the ears of reporters that go on themselves on TV to push this stuff. So there's no question that the, the there's a been a uh, decline in journalistic standards on TV and in the press. There are fewer jobs, um, and they are openly now pushing a government position where they did it more covertly before, but it was never great. I'll put it that way. Now, Joe, people talk about the Uniparty, and they say that on issues of foreign policy, the de Democrats and the Republicans are basically the same. But do you think there's also a unit narrative, a narrative that everyone goes along with and it's beyond ideology and gets into some of this? How important do you think people talk about the World Economic Forum? Do you think they're under something or do you think they're crazy conspiracy theorists? Joe Lawyer? Uh, well, just in general, I would say that there's no question there's one a narrative that's enforced about foreign affairs on uh, international policy. Domestically, there are differences, I think, up between the two parties. But on foreign affairs, they're indistinguishable from one another. And it's, a, you know, it's an agenda that pushes the U.S. Uh, interests abroad. That's what not what journalism should be doing. You should be reporting what's happening in the conflict between nations, which is incredibly dramatic and important to report by giving both sides of the story, the, try to get the point of view of all the players, whether they, one of them is Iran or not, or North Korea. Try to find out what you can, what is going on, make the U.S. just one of the players. But of course, the way it's news is presented to us about international affairs, it's the U.S. is the good guy. It's that kindergartenish. And, and, and certain countries who are not with the U.S. are the bad guys. I'm not going to go with the World Economic Forum because I, uh, it's not something that I've delved very deeply into, but I don't trust them. I mean, this is a very important uh, meeting in Davos, for example, every year, and, they, and other things happen throughout the year. And these, these are very powerful people who compare notes, and there's no question that they probably agree on things, whether they can implement that through the media, through their governments is another matter, but if they're not to be trusted, that's for sure. I'll say that about the WEF. Now, Joe, you, you talk a lot about U.S. Uh, homogeneity. Did I get that right? I think so. <laughs> I, okay, I think so. It's a tough word for me, but homogeneity. Yeah. Can you talk about ways in which this world that the U.S. has run has not worked out well for the U.S. We we talk about the U.S. running everything and global homogeneity, but do you think that's worked out well for the U.S. or badly for the people of the United States? For the people of the United States, it's worked out yes. terribly. For the rulers, uh, for the economic and political interests of very powerful people, it has up until now worked out pretty well. That's why they're doing it. They're not doing it because they're interested in the well-being of the American people or the European people or any people, uh, or the Ukrainian people. They don't care about 
this. This is from their actions. You can tell this. So, what is happening now, of course, is uh, what they've done in terms of the economic warfare against Russia has certainly backfired, particularly in Europe. It has not brought down the Russian economy. It has it's threatening the European economy and to a lesser extent the American one. And this is something extraordinary. Is this what they want? They had to know this could happen, or they didn't. I mean, we never know exactly the level of intelligence, the amount of thought or gaming theory that they went through to see, well, what could happen. Somebody had to know that this could be one of the results, that the sanctions against Russia could backfire uh, on the West, which is what they have done. But as I argued in a piece uh, that I wrote on February 4th in Consortium News, that's 20 days before the Russian invasion, that the U.S. was setting, the U.S. wanted this invasion. They needed Russia to invade because otherwise they couldn't launch the economic war, the information war, and the proxy war against Russia, which, whose aim is to bring down the Russian government. We've heard that directly from Biden now, from Lloyd Austin, uh, to weaken Russia. There's no doubt in my mind. And I thought I was really uh, smart during that 20 days before the invasion. But now we just republished a piece from John Pilger, who wrote, if Putin can be provoked into coming to their aid, meaning the people of Donbass, his preordained pariah role will justify a NATO-run guerrilla war that's likely to spill into Russia itself. So even Pilger back eight years ago saw where this was headed, uh, that this would be a U.S. Uh, uh, mostly the responsibility of the U.S. to push Russia as far as they did until they could not take any more and they actually invaded. And again, that's what the U.S. wanted. But I want to add this right now, that I think the time for responsibility, the time for who is right and who's wrong in Ukraine is over. We've got to end this war. It has gotten way too dangerous now. We can have that argument later. We've got two powers facing off now. And if Russia interprets an attack on these new republics that, the, that they're going to, new uh, provinces of Ukraine that they will absorb into Russia very soon. If they interpret that as an attack on the Russian Federation to rise into the level where we could see a nuclear exchange, we are, we, we, we've got to stop this immediately. And normally you need an outside power to come in, a neutral power to say, okay, guys, stop it. And that would be the UN. And unfortunately, throughout the long history of the UN, and I covered UN headquarters for 25 years, as you no leave for the Boston Globe and the Wall Street Journal and, the, and a bunch of other newspapers. The Secretary General of the UN, the only one who ever did something like that was Dag Hammarskjöld, the second Secretary General who stood up to both the Soviet Union and the United States and made himself a, a, an impartial arbiter of affairs. And guess what happened to him? He was most likely assassinated when his plane went down. The current Secretary General has completely destroyed any impartiality. He's totally taken the West side 100 percent in this very complex conflict rather than being nuanced about it. So he has no role to play. And this is what I fear. This is really what I wanted to say on your program, that I fear that without uh, any role by a, a, an arbiter, we are just putting our Everyone's lives is in the hands of the leaders of the United States and Russia right now, basically. You could forget about NATO and Europe because they just pretty much do what the U.S. says. Although at the very beginning of this conflict, you did see Macron of France and Schultz of Germany going to uh, Moscow to try to uh, listen to what Putin was saying, at least. And that's when they Russia put forward those pe those treaties, those draft treaties in December, that had they been at least negotiated seriously, had Minsk been implemented about Donbass, giving it uh, autonomy. Don't forget, Russia went eight years ignoring the Declaration of Independence of both those uh, provinces in Ukraine and Donbass. They were pushing for the Minsk Accord. So for eight years, Russia was patient about this. And France and Germany, the leaders there, realize that Russia's security interests are important. Henry Kissinger has recognized that. But this group of neocons running the show right now in Washington with their allies, like in the Green Party in Germany, have really pushed this thing way too far. And I don't know where it's going to end. No one does. And as I said, there's no one to step in who's impartial to try to stop this. And do you trust the U.S. people, Austin and so on, to not go nuclear? Up until, honest, now, up, in, up until now, I have thought the Pentagon was the only uh, force that was saving us in the U.S. side because uh, 
From the very beginning of this conflict, there were voices in the State Department, some in Congress, who talked about a direct NATO or U.S. war against Russia. And this had to be avoided. Even Biden, to his credit, said we have to avoid that because that's World War III. He used that term early on in the spring. Uh, and the Pentagon, I have still put my hopes that they will uh, pull back and not allow this to happen. But of course, there's the other side. And I don't know what's going on in the Kremlin. And we, uh, I, as I say, what we don't know now is are these new territories that are about to become, from Russia's point of view, part of the Russian Federation, if they're attacked, in what way will they be attacked? Could it trigger some uh, nuclear use by Russia. I don't believe they put in threatened nuclear attack, as everyone in the West is saying, as Biden has said at the UN. I think this was a warning. And I think there's a difference between a threat and a warning. If you go up to a, an electric power station and there's a sign that says warning, high voltage, it doesn't say threat, high voltage. There's a difference. It was a warning. And I hope that the warning is heard. But that would mean that the NATO and the West would have to start negotiating now and end this conflict with this territory most likely staying in the hands of Russia. Ukrainians are not going to accept that. NATO is not going to accept that. Certainly Washington will not because their aim is to drag this war out as long as possible to bleed and weaken Russia. Are they going to give up on that faced with nuclear attack? This is why the warning was given. And it was a warning given on February 24th in Putin's speech announcing the war when he said he reminded the world that they had nuclear weapons if anybody interferes. So that was also a warning that we have to take that warning seriously and not allow this war to continue another day. But I don't see it ending very soon. Do you, Lee? I, I don't see I, I don't see where this is going at all. Uh, and I, I'm very worried about it because I used to think that the U.S. would not possibly go there. Now I think they might have no choice but to go there because the only way to get out of the trouble they created for the world economically may be to go to war. Does it make sense, Joe? Yeah, but nu not nuclear war. You know, if there were no nuclear weapons, there's no question there would have been a conventional war. NATO would have probably invaded, invaded Russia. Um, there's somebody, Alberto Moravi, an Italian novelist from way back in the 60s and 70s, who wrote a book about this basically how nuclear weapons have saved the world from World War III. And it still is to this moment. Uh, otherwise, there would have been, without question. Uh, uh, a conventional war right now between Russia and NATO. We have to avoid that happening. This never should have happened. The U.S. could have stopped this by agreeing to talk about those draft proposals, implementing Minsk. And that would have at least put a long break on this. There's no way Russia. And I do think that Putin has made revanchist statements in the past that Ukraine, parts of which were, of course, conquered by Catherine the Great. That's the Russian imperialism, by the way. This nonsense about a Russian imperial. They're not an imperialist power in Ukraine. That happened in the 18th right. century. That was Russian imperialism. It, it was part of Russia until Khrushchev gave that to Ukraine in 1954. And those were all and still are Russian lands. And those people were attacked in Donbass after the coup in 2014. And I think this has given an opportunity for uh, Putin to say we're taking back those countries, uh, those parts of Ukraine that were a part of Russia for so long. That's not imperialism, because imperialism, when you go somewhere where you've never been before and they don't want you there, <laughs> that's imperialism. They were right, there, the right. Russians have been there, and the people are welcome. Many of the Russian speakers are welcoming at least Russia, and they're going to vote for this referendum. I just want to clear that this is a revanchism is different than uh, imperialism, and it wouldn't have happened. It's not a cause of this war. It's a consequence of this war. The causes of this war I put squarely on the West side. I know this makes me a Putin puppet. Well, go to hell, you know? I'm sorry. I was just saying, I was just saying to my friend today, because he was asking me about this, I said, he goes, who's responsible for the war? You know, the war? Is it UK, Ukraine or Russia? I said, United States. <laughs> yeah. and you couldn't so he understand like, that, right? Whole, he, no, I had to go into a whole explanation right. about what we did and NATO and, right. you know, but the whole like I said, the whole the whole thing, this is sham. This voting is a sham, is a preemptive strike because they know how this vote's going to go. You know, it, and they and they don't tell the people. If you watch the news, they don't tell the people the whole story about. You know, these are Russian speakers. These are basically Russians. They they've been wanting to be a part of Russia. They don't talk about that on the news. They just tell you, oh, here comes a fake vote, and they're going to fake say that it's so stupid. 
When have you heard about the thousands of people who were killed since 2014 by a U.S.-backed coup government in, in Kiev against the people in the Donbass? I mean, there was not one word spoken at the U.N. Security Council meeting about that, except by Lavrov. So this is just airbrushed out of the story. And that's the way you control a story, but not by necessarily overtly lying, by cutting out important context, which changes the entire narrative. And this is the one that the majority of people, right. and if you want to put forward causes of the war, like uh, historians did when they said that the, the, the Versailles Treaty, the onerous conditions on Germany led, was one of the reasons leading to Nazism in World War II. Well, nobody accuses those historians of being pro-Nazi. But if you try to explain the causes of this war, then you're, of course, you know, I'm just getting paid by the Kremlin. So it's just yeah. kind of a very, yeah. very difficult environment to to speak in and to argue in because there's such confusion purposely sown, mostly by the West here. And, and Joe, I, I put it on that at Consortium News, you're carrying on the journalistic legacy of the great Robert Perry. Have you went back and watched the film Ukraine on Fire? Featuring Robert Perry lately. Well, I saw, exactly the, follow I saw the follow up featuring you as well. Yes. I, yes. I did. See, I saw both of them. Yes. Uh, when back a couple of months ago when the crisis really turned hot, but I'd seen it originally too. And we had uh, Igor on the director on our webcast yes. CN Live for about two hours, three Please. hours. He spoke to us. Yeah. And Robert, Robert Perry in 2014, in 2015, was prescient on this. You've been. Consortium News have been reporting the truth since well before the military operation went off. Is that right, Joe? That's that's correct. As I pointed out, Pilger's piece was published in The Guardian, which we republished yes, or over the weekend. But yes, Bob Perry wrote a story in 2014 saying, ready for a nuclear war over Ukraine. And I frankly, when I saw that, I read it, I thought, well, maybe he's gone a little too far this, <laughs> this time. And he was completely on, on the mark, wasn't he? Now I know he was right, but at the time I thought it was exaggerated. It wasn't. Yes, Bob understood uh, the key facts of Ukraine before a lot of people in the United States. Certainly at that time there wasn't as much alternative media. Or it was starting to pipe up but much more now in the last eight years. But, but of course we've been around since 1995. Bob Perry founded this thing, former AP investigative journalist. So Bob was way, way ahead of the game. And there were our reporting on Ukraine then, and I have to say now, has been amongst the best you're going to find anywhere. That's unfortunate. Well, I wish it was wider yeah, known. I, what I, saying. I agree, though. I agree completely. Yes. And Joe, let me talk about this for a second. You're a great publisher and journalist with a lot of mainstream and independent journalists credibility. Do you think, as I do, that the most important virtue for journalists these days is courage? It's <clears throat> not so much, it's not, the truth is actually not that hard to figure out, but reporting the truth requires, I think, a lot of courage and bravery to fight against the narrative and the attacks that come on people. What do you think, Joe Laurie? I, I do. It's not the same kind of courage as being a war correspondent, but it doesn't, hasn't done us any Agreed. favors. It hasn't done us any favors to report what we've had. Instead, it's brought uh, PayPal to suspend us permanently so we can't raise money through PayPal. And a news guard gave us the red letter because uh, they say that we've published false information about Ukraine. I responded with a 9,000-word article that anyone could read in which I dissected everything that they said that we had said wrong. And I think I made the case that they, in fact— uh, needed to correct their reporting on Ukraine, but of course I didn't stop them. So there, there are many difficulties to stick to what you think the facts are telling you, despite this outside noise. And of course, everyone knows what uh, it could be like to be attacked by trolls and organized trolls on social media. I mean, I put that Pilger story on our uh, Twitter page, and about 30 trolls came out immediately to attack him in the most vicious kind of way. It's ridiculous. It made me laugh, but that's out there. They're organized. They're ready to stop you. Uh, there are organizations like NewsGuard that want to damage your reputation with a red mark. There's PayPal that will, wants to damage you financially. We don't know where else this will lead. But, yes, so that's the kind of courage I think before people would say to me, oh, you have a lot of courage. I didn't believe them. But I think now, I mean, consortium news, I think now 
Uh, back then, it was just you're a Putin puppet, you're a Kremlin stooge, you're a Saddam apologist. When Bob wrote about things, why the yep. invasion of Iraq shouldn't have happened. So that was the level of attack then, which was pretty bad. But yeah, okay, and now it's still moved is. into. Yeah, it's, that still happens, but now it's we've added uh, organization like NewsGuard giving people red marks. We have gotten out yep. oh, PayPal, yeah. and we don't know what else is out there. We've got this kill list on uh, in Ukraine, in which one of our writers, Scott Ritter, uh, is on that list. Roger Waters, the rock musician, is on that list. So. Um, you know, it's that the stakes are getting higher, so the courage has to get stronger. And and in regards to that, do you have any opinion on Edward Snowden becoming a dual citizen of Russia and the U.S. today? I know only that what what took so long is that Snowden was not trying to become a Russian citizen. In fact, I think he was trying to avoid that because he knows that once he becomes one, a lot of people will use that against him. What do you think, Joe? Oh, absolutely. He knew that that's what happened, and it's happening already. From what I understand, uh, I read, I don't know how true it is, but I think he wanted a passport. He doesn't have his American passport. Remember, it was canceled. That's how he wound up in Russia to begin with. He was on his way to somewhere in Latin America, and the plane, probably Cuba, and the plane from Hong Kong stopped in Moscow, and he was going to transfer to another plane. And when he landed, the Russian authorities uh, saw that his passport that he presented was not valid. It had been canceled while he was in flight. So it's the American, it's the State Department that forced him into Russia to begin with. That has to be known. Now he wants to be able to travel. He has no passport. He'll have a Russian passport. He's got to be damn careful, and I'm sure he's very well aware of this, to wherever he goes, because there are people out to get him. There's no question about that if he leaves Russia. And I don't know where he would go, and oh, certainly he'd probably be in disguise, and I don't know where he's going to go, but he's certainly not coming back to the U.S. because uh, he will be immediately put in jail and tried under the Espionage Act, as they're trying to do to Julian Assange, who, by the way, helped him get out of Hong Kong. So I think this is all a practical thing for Snowden. I don't think he'd rather, he'd rather not have a Russian passport. It's the Americans, again, who forced him into Russia and are forcing him to get a Russian passport. What other passport would he get being in, being living in Russia right now? So Right. And you brought up Assange. And recently, you co-hosted an Assange event in D.C. So talk about that a little bit and the upcoming October event for Assange. Yeah, yeah we, went to, we were at the Cleveland Park Library in Washington, and uh, we had a live audience there, and we also had guests online on our Zoom, on our webcast through Zoom, and it was the first time we ever did anything like that technically, and it came off pretty much without a hitch, and it was, the aim of this program was to give the basic issues about Assange to, to uh, debunk five myths about Assange, being a rapist, not being a journalist, being a hacker, things of that sort. Uh, and also we brought on uh, Daniel Ellsberg, of course, the Pentagon Papers whistleblower, James Goodall, who was the New York Times general counsel during the Pentagon Papers case, both extremely worried about Assange and the fate of the First Amendment because of what they're doing to Julian Assange or what they want to do if they bring him here. And we also had John Kiriakou, a CIA whistleblower. We had two people who were charged under the Espionage Act, Ellsberg and Kiriakou. He was at the library with us. We had Chip Gibbons at the library. Uh, and we have Stefania Morizzi, an Italian journalist, who sp spoke a lot about about the rape, uh, the, the false rape allegations, and Kathy Vogan, our executive producer of our webcast, and uh, who's written articles for us about the hacking allegations against Assange, why they're false. So uh, this was a basic uh, uh, exposition of the, the issues around Assange intended for a general audience. 15,000 people were invited in a circular in that neighborhood around Cleveland Park in Northwest DC, and 40 people showed up. It's pretty sad. But we had over 4,000, close to 5,000 viewers so far online. But it's still, people are not wanting to open their minds about Assange. The National Press Club refuses to support him, even though the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, Reporters Without Borders, the International Federation of Journalists, and numerous other press and human rights organizations are supporting Assange and calling on Biden to drop these charges. The press club in Washington, of which I'm a member, refuses even though they're very and well aware of the case Joe, they've told Joe, us. Yeah. Joe, without wanting to get you in a fight with anyone, because yeah. I don't want to. I'm ready. I'm are ready. You, Go ahead. Are you, <laughs> are you suspicious of journalists who do not talk about Assange? 
Well, I, I think I know why uh, they probably don't, because they don't want to face the issues. Because if they did and they really studied it just a little bit, they realize what is going on and what's wrong with the prosecution of this journalist. And he is a he engaged in journalistic activity. It really doesn't matter whether we call him a journalist or not. His activity was journalistic, and that was what Bob Perry, our founder, wrote in December of 2010. That he, what Assange was doing was exactly what he did, and he is well known for breaking some of the biggest Iran Contra stories for the Associated Press, including naming Oliver north and his role in that so the article the title was titled uh, we are all, all all journalists are julian assange so they don't want to look at it they want to cling to the joe, fact that joe he was Royer, a hacker yep joe we're okay. out of time but it's truly an honor to have you on the show great appearance as usual and please come back on sometime soon to talk about more stuff that's going on a dose of truth from joe lawyer from consortium news Read that every day. And thanks so much to Carmine Sabia for doing a great job as our guest co-host. And thanks so much to the great Ted Rawl. I got to buy some of his art soon at RALL.com. We'll see you tomorrow here on The Backstory.